National Urban League et al. versus Trump. Um, this case was our response to Executive Order 13950, which was an order that former President Trump signed back in September of 2020. Um, and this order did a couple of things. First, it kind of laid out this ahistorical narrative um, of the nation's history being founded on principles of racial equity, uh, even though we all know that the subjugation of Black Americans was codified in laws throughout the country up until 1964. Um, and the executive order also uh, prohibited federal contractors, federal workers, federal grantees, members of the U.S. military um, from engaging in discussions, including workplace trainings um, on what the then president defined as being divisive concepts or race and sex stereotyping or race and sex based scapegoating. Um, so from that description, as you can tell, these were very vague terms. It was hard to understand what all would be prohibited under the executive order. Um, but what we could discern for sure was that this order would prohibit um, discussions and workplace trainings that we need on issues like race and gender-based privileges, um, implicit biases, uh, and systemic discrimination. Executive Order 13950 came in response to, if you look at the timeline, our summer of really racial reckoning in this country. So summer of 2020, you had the murder of George Floyd, the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, the killing of Breonna Taylor. And the country was really grappling with the question of how can Black Americans be treated so brutally in a country that purports to uphold values of liberty and equality? Um, and in answering that question of how or why are Black citizens being treated this way, um, you saw a lot of people questioning monuments that we have in this country to Confederate soldiers who believed in the subjugation of Black Americans, monuments we have to slave owners, former slave owners who believed in the subjugation of Black Americans. And you also saw U.S. citizens asking for more information about the nation's history of racial subjugation, um, seeking out forms of information and trainings about how they can improve their own views of people of color in this country since they've grown up informed uh, by a system uh, that, that thrived on racial subordination for so long. And it was in response to that um, desire to gain more knowledge um, in response to trainings that teach about the implicit biases uh, we may have from growing up in a country that allowed racial subordination in its laws for so long that this executive order was implemented, prohibiting the very trainings that would seek to teach and guide employees in the federal government or employees for federal contractors about um, how they can interact with their colleagues in a more equitable, respectful way. This, this executive order was a part of a broader package than President Trump, former President Trump put forth. That package included him implementing what he called like a garden of our national heroes where he would re-erect statues to individuals that had been torn down during the reckoning because the individuals owned slaves or were Confederate soldiers, um, where he issued, President Trump also issued the 1776 Commission to push back on the idea that um, the racial caste system of chattel slavery was not, uh, was, was not foundational to the country's founding. Um, so for me to be able to have an opportunity to file a lawsuit that sets the record straight on this nation's history um, and also challenges the unconstitutionalities of these types of 
prohibitions on speech and viewpoints um, was incredibly empowering when the president of your country um, is setting forth ideas that can feel oppressive. So about a month after the executive order was signed into law, we filed a lawsuit representing the National Urban League, the National Fair Housing Alliance, and other similarly, similarly situated plaintiffs. Um, and we, we challenged the executive order for representing a violation of First Amendment rights, being viewpoint discrimination, um, for Fifth Amendment due process rights being violated because the order was so vague, it was hard to understand what specific speech uh, would be prohibited, and for Fifth Amendment equal protection rights being violated due to the order's intentional discrimination. What was so important about LDF filing this lawsuit, daring to file a lawsuit against the president, against his agencies, for having the nerve <laughs> to uh, have such a, an egregious uh, violation of, of what we can say and teach about race and discrimination in this country. Um, without that, that check on power, um, then, then I'm afraid because the tone comes from the top, um, you would see uh, even more of an issue of people withholding information or prohibiting trainings on accurate portrayals of American history, you would see that metastasize even more throughout this country. And so, um, you know, where th that's the purpose of having a constitution, right? That's the purpose of being a civil rights uh, lit litigator, to have a check on power, and to, to be able to use the courts as a check on power um, when, when power is abused. And, you know, stamping out speech, especially speech that is intended to help people who have been historically subjugated in this country is unacceptable. Um, because the, this order not only targeted, um, you know, black people and, and people of color, but it also targeted ideas of like sex-based discrimination. So, so women and folks of other genders were, were um, under threat of this, this order as, as well. So um, it just represents a robust check on power that I think um, was, was deeply, deeply needed in that moment. And then in December of 2020, in a separate but parallel case, uh, challenging the same executive order, a judge saw fit to issue a nationwide injunction, a nationwide preliminary injunction, temporarily uh, enjoining the federal government from enforcing this order against federal contractors and grant recipients. Um, a few weeks later, we then filed an amended complaint and we added as a plaintiff, the American Association for Access, Equity and Diversity. Uh, and we also added several defendants, including federal government agencies and agency heads that had moved forward with implementing uh, the executive order. Shortly thereafter, while we were thinking through our own uh, filing for a preliminary injunction, uh, President Biden swiftly revoked the executive order, fortunately, the same day he was inaugurated. Uh, so we were very grateful for this outcome. What I hope would be the legacy of this case is that as we're seeing, you know, even though President Biden revoked this executive order, there have been a lot of copycat bills popping up across the country. Um, and it is my hope that, you know, we do not feel disempowered in the face of these legislative attempts to control what is taught about the history of this nation. And, and it is my hope that the legacy of this case is that, you know, folks will feel that, you know, the Constitution is theirs too. It's meant to protect us too. And the First Amendment is ours too, right? It's it's our rights to be protected as well. And and um, you know, protest is important, civil disobedience is important. I think it's also important that we, we, we wield, um, uh, you know, the courts and the constitution in a way that demands that they respect our rights too. And I hope that that's what we see happen in response to all these, you know, we call them copycat bills that are popping up telling you 
you know, your children can't read about Ruby Bridges or about Martin Luther King. And it's just flat out unacceptable under the First Amendment, um, especially in a country um, with a history like ours. And so it's my hope that uh, we continue and in conjunction with the protests and the, and the pushback, continue to force courts to recognize that this is unacceptable under the Constitution.